It's time to learn from the best at Game Devs. A Tony Chan here, and welcome to episode 85 of Game Dev Loda, where I chat with inspiring professionals every Wednesday morning to bring you the motivation and tactics for a successful gaming career. Now, let's chat with today's future guest, a Tommy Arakam. Tommy, it's game time. Are you ready? I'm ready. Yes. Tommy is the project lead and CEO of Thrim Studios, hailing out of Norway. Currently, they are working on their first game, a 17th century trade sim. And Tommy, like me, came from the oil industry and making a big transition from a safe, well-paid job over to creating his own studio and going for a very ambitious game. And he also got a publisher at the start of the development and funds to create the demo. So that's awesome to hear. Uh, real quick, though, give us a bit about your personal life and how you got started in the game industry, Tommy? Uh, yeah, uh, as you mentioned, I come from the oil industry. Uh, I've been working with logistics for a long time. And before that, I was doing customer service and paint or jobs and stuff like that. Um, and uh, what happened was the oil industry took a huge hit some years ago. People around me were getting fired and it was just very tough going to work. And I was like, huh, I need to do something. I need to change my life. Uh, so I started uh, the university, uh, studying game design. Uh, I'm actually still doing a bachelor. Yeah, I started my own studio and uh, kind of learned from there, I guess. <laughs> yeah, you're right, because the oil industry, even today right now, is still kind of bad. Like cause I'm in the oil industry as well since I'm in Houston, and yeah, it's it, it was bad a few years ago, yeah. and it's still kind of slow at the moment, so... Yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, it it is pretty shady. It's uh, it's not going to get better anyway because uh, you're not going to get the same numbers um, because now the, the companies are are going for that shift for more cleaner energy anyway. So, uh, but you know, when the oil price was like over what was it, hundred and twenty dollars a barrel, that was like the party time of the oil industry. Like it was chaotic, and then it dropped to I think it was as low as twenty nine dollars when it was on the worst. Uh, and it was like that was a, we had meetings at work like every month. They're like, oh, we're gonna talk about how the business is going, and everybody was like, oh yeah, so we're getting fired. <laughs> uh-huh. You know, so it's like shit. Yeah, it's crazy. So that big transition, like, I, I guess, like, what, what make that big decision? Like, what, what just trigger that that moment for you just to switch over to, you know, you you went you're going to school now for game design. Like, what was that trigger? That big trigger. Uh, my son was that big trigger, um, and um, the it was basically that I wanted to do something that was fun. Uh, I wanted to do something that was already a hobby of mine, just playing games and. Everybody wants to create their own game. Like, if you're a gamer, you always had the thought, like, oh man, it would be so cool if I made a game like do this and this. So it basically, that's just how it changed, basically, because I wanted to do a bachelor, I wanted to get a degree, that was for certain, and then it basically was, uh, what do I want to get a degree in? So I'd actually did one semester of 3D movie production before I jumped over to bachelor in games, um, because I was like, hmm, I like doing 3D. So why not just try to do that in games? And then later on, it became to the point where I was like, you know what, I'm just going to create my own game because I don't want to wait three years because then I'm going to be 33 and um, basically not basically be too late for me to come in as an artist at 34 because the young guys today, they're growing up with 3D in a different way than we did. So I can go to art station and like, I'll see a 14-year-old doing better art than me. And he's like, oh, I just did this for fun. And I'm like, <laughs> what? For fun? Like, I would spend a month on that. He's like, yeah, mm, you know. So that's, yeah, I just, I had to do it myself, basically. So that's how the whole studio and the idea came to pass. Yeah, yeah. Man, they, I, I don't know if they, like the newcomers, they have so much opportunity and just a lot of free sources now that they could use. So they definitely got a, a really good going if they're trying to get into oh, the yeah. industry. And of they, course, got it, they got it easy. They got it. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what they I, I was talking to an animator that did some work for us and he used to work for Disney back in the day. And he's like, you guys, you don't know how easy you have it with this 3d animation thing compared to how we were doing it. And I'm like, yeah, I know. <laughs> it's like, it's a, yeah, it is. It is pretty easy for him. It's still hard. It's still, you know, need a lot of work to become at the pro level because the ch- changing the, the change in the industry is like so rapidly. But still, they do have it, like really 
really good. So definitely. So uh, let's touch upon a view. So you started a studio, and then you actually got a publisher to uh, fund your demo. So how did that go about? Like, since because you're new, like you you don't even have a lot of gaming development experience. How were you able to persuade a publisher to you know fund a demo? Well, uh, it was quite interesting because uh, I started the whaler idea um, back in November 2016. That's uh, so when I was starting basically writing it down and doing research. I spent like what I do is I take 10 game ideas I have and I write them down. I do the elevator pitch system, uh, write it down. Uh, I leave it for a few months and I just play a lot of similar games and then I come back and I look at them and I'm like, okay, which one of these stands out? Which one is like, okay, this one I need to pick. Fact is, there was about three ideas that I was like, hmm, these sound kind of good. I need to do something here. And the whaler was the one that kind of stood out out of those three. So I started doing a lot of research during this area and uh, I started doing some art for it, just Putting it together, uh, I contacted a consultant, which I think was uh, amazing. Who he has like, I think, ten years experience in the gaming industry. Um, he's worked on quite a few big games, um, and I just uh, asked him, like, what do you think about this idea? Uh, I also asked my teacher at school, and um, he's like, well, this is something that is very interesting. This is niche. This is uh, it's ambitious, but it's doable. So we just, you know, took all my ideas, all the things that I wanted in the game. I had like 30 ideas, and he's like, "You can't have 30. That is, that is way too big." Uh, so take the core features of the game, put them down to maybe six, and then just go even. If you can make four or five features uh, that we can implement in a demo, then we'll focus on that. So we spent some time doing mock-ups and all sort of stuff, and I started posting it on IndieDB. Uh, I started doing dev updates and just writing about the game and just shaping it from art point of view of 2D art and illustrations. And IndieDB shared the game on Twitter, and uh, I woke up the next day, and I had like two emails from publishers. Oh. Um, and I was like, huh, what is this? <laughs> like, it, it, this can't, this has to be, this has to be like a scam or something, because that, this, this can't be, can't be like this. So I started talking to Two of them. I was actually in Brazil at this time uh, on vacation, three months, and uh, yeah, we we had some meetings, and uh, we, they wanted to know more about the idea. Like, is this just about hunting whales? And I'm like, no, <laughs> it's about uh, trading. The trade is the core thing. It's just called a whaler because I couldn't call it the trader. That would be just silly. And um, it kind of just shaped from there. We made a made a deal uh, in August and. Uh, we started getting uh, money to do a uh, demo uh, from August and then until December. Nice. So, uh, yeah, yeah you, it, you, it was intense. Yeah. It's not like you did everything right from the get go. Like you, you didn't overwhelm yourself with too many ideas and put it in one game. Yeah. And, and yeah, you cut out down the features, made them a bit more simpler, and uh, you're able to get a consulting and get feedback on your game so that yeah you're staying on the right track and you're you know you're posting it on on the forums and stuff like that well do you recall the elevator pitch like or was posting on the forum the elevator pitch like what was the elevator pitch of your of your game if you recall uh yeah it was basically uh it was a 16th century game where you can take control of a, of a full explorable ship and you will do trading uh, all over the world. Uh, at that time, we had four zones, so we would do you would do trading in four zones, and you could buy better, uh, bigger ships. You can customize your captain's cabin. You can do crafting, and you can then hunt whales if you want to to earn more. Uh, that was basically the the small elevator pitch because I think it's you're supposed to tell your game in about like 25 seconds or something like that. So it was basically the trade element that sold it, and then it was like the whaling thing because it was. Uh, at the peak of the whaling industry as well. That bit was a little bit controversial, even at Gamescom. It was like, hmm, because uh, we had like a big uh, poster and stuff like that uh, at Gamescom, and uh, we had brochures so people can, you know, talk about it and ask questions. So, uh, yeah, the elevator pitch was basically uh, trading and whaling and changing and controlling your ship. So, so how does it feel to be CEO? How, how many people are in your team? Uh, we are about 10 people now. Oh, wow. um, 
Yeah, we are 10 people there. Mostly of them are freelancers. We are, the core team is um, uh, me and Mike. Uh, Mike is a programmer and consultant. And then we have Jay who does the, the user interface. And then we have uh, Juris and Linus and a lot of other people that has worked on some models for Days of War and their own game. Uh, who does 3D. Uh, we have Dominic Meyer who does um, some of our 2D art and a lot of the cool and the new the new 2D art we've been posting is is, uh, is from Dominic and he's also doing some of the UE art now. Um, so yeah, they uh, it's it's getting bigger and bigger actually. We're trying to keep the team small, like around 10 people is is what we what we want it to be. Um, because if uh, you know one of the mistakes uh, beginner devs does is that they rush into a big team, and uh, what happens is that you will have people falling off, and uh, you will have disagreements because you maybe you didn't know or research the the business part of it. Uh, this rev share model and stuff that people do, like I have this great idea, let's come together and do it, and they just start doing it. But they don't sit down and say, okay, who's going to do what? Um, if this game makes money. Uh, how is the share going to be? And all this stuff, you need to think about all that stuff. This is the research part of it. So, um, yeah, keeping it small and not be getting it too big was, is very crucial for us. So were, are you the main one or do you go with Mike to choose a team member? Like, how, how, does it, how do you go about hiring someone or hiring a freelancer? Uh, I choose them. Uh, Mike does the programmers basically. If he sees uh, a guy that has, because he know I am, I, I, I'm really bad at coding. Like I don't understand coding. I'm sorry, guys. I just don't get it. Uh, so sometimes when Mike is like talking, and then I'll be like, "Hold on, talk to me like I'm five. <laughs> what are you talking about?" And so that's why he does the coders because he knows what to ask. He knows what to expect from them. Uh, so he he has like a, a freedom to say that okay, I need an extra guy, I need two extra guys, and then we just go and we find them and bring them in. So when you're trying to hire more people, do you have to go back to the publisher and ask for more money? Like, or, or can I even ask that? I don't I don't know how uh, I can ask that. But like, uh, uh, I'm just curious, like, how the relationship work with publisher when you're trying to increase the fund and you know hire more people? Well, at, at, as of right now, we haven't really had that problem um, where we had to go and ask them for more. Of course, obviously, it would be great, uh, but uh, we have managed with the little we got. So it's the thing is like right now we don't need more people in a sense, and if we need it, they're just in for an asset or two or just a small time job. Because when we start the full version uh, in March, I think yeah, March, obviously we're gonna restock a little bit and probably need more. But we're also going to crowdfunding in February. Oh, okay. Uh, so uh, everything kind of leans upon that because everything can change with crowdfunding. Either it stays the same as we're doing now. Or it just gets drastically much bigger. So uh, it's kind of wait and see moment right now. <laughs> yeah, Tommy, I, I got to give you props because you came into this and you already have like around ten people working, and you must be doing a great job managing everybody and, and leading the team. Well, uh, <laughs> it was a learning experience that as well because when you're coming, when you're not, when you're used to coming from a structured way of working in the oil industry where everything is just like, it, it's just how it is. And then you come here where, where it's like, sometimes you feel like the Indian environment is kind of, uh, we call it Texas in Norway. It's like it, when everything's <laughs> a little bit, you know, wild west crazy. And um, I got that feeling sometimes because we had some really bad moments where, where uh, I would hire uh, freelancers and I would be too naive basically. If it was cheap, it was good. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, oh, that's a great price. We have to go with this guy. But as I've learned, it is just the cheaper. If it's really cheap, what you're getting usually is too good to be true. And that ended up hurting the project. So, so it's a learning experience. But the thing is, I have to learn that now while we're so early. Because if I, if, if this happened like later in the project, it could be a project killer. It's, you know, good job. I don't know. Uh, thank you for thinking that, but it's, it's it's a, it's a real challenge, uh, you know. It, it's not supposed to be easy, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I hope I do a good job. Like we are, we're we're still going ahead, still going forward. <laughs> we haven't had people quitting, so uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you gotta give you give some self some credit. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, yeah. managing people is is just never easy. Uh, so 
yeah, there's definitely a learning experience. And yeah, that, that's a great point I want to take to the next one. It's like, I want to talk about your worst moment now, like that one moment that's still a vivid in your mind. Uh, whether you could go into more details about hiring, uh, you know, someone that was cheap that didn't turn out good or uh, something else in general. Like, what was a really bad moment that you still remember? <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Uh, well, we had, um, we had an artist coming in uh, in August. I talked to him while I was in Brazil. Uh, this was a high-end artist. Uh, he dropped his price significantly to make uh, a ship for us, um, which was, you know, when you don't have experience getting this kind of artist to do a job, is like, that's big. That was big for me. That was, that was something I was really proud of. And uh, what happened is, after he, I did the mistake of paying in advance, mm. And after he got paid, it was a communication block out for like four months. Oh, wow. Like we were supposed to get the ship in September so we could use um, the rest of the month to implement and, and have a playable version in December and go on Kickstarter in January. Uh, but not uh, when 8% of our entire budget was just lost and no communication, that was the toughest and the worst moment ever. Uh, that was four months I was horrible to be around, uh, even for my wife, because I wasn't sleeping. It stressed my – because I had a contract at this time, you know, and, and I had people waiting. We were waiting for the ship. It was like that is the level for the player. And, uh, yeah, that was the worst insane moment I've ever experienced, and it hurt the project so bad. It was four months uh, late, 8% gone, and then you have to consider we have to use maybe – 10, 12% more to get a new artist doing it and then spend two months, one and a half months doing a new ship and then implementing. So we're, we're still in January and we're actually getting the ship ready this month. Uh, and it should have been done at the end of September. And, uh, luckily it seems that I'm very persistent. So I'm not used to this kind of treatment when people just take my money and go. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I went full old school on him and sent emails every single day uh, demanding that uh, I needed uh, feedback. And we actually heard back from him in um, December that, like, oh, I already did the refund, and we got a fake receipt. Oh, That's my how bad gosh. it was. <laughs> and, um, yeah, uh, I found out that it was fake because it was freaking obvious, and uh, I contacted his bank, and I said, hey, is this how the, the receipts looks? Uh, they were like, uh, can't go into details, but no, we can confirm that this is not how it is. So, uh, and then he contacted me the same day, actually, again, when the bank contacted. And it looks like we might get our refund back. So that's good. But, uh, yeah, that was the worst moment. Oh, it still hasn't gone through yet. Oh, my no. God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. So... Does that completely change your pay schedule now? Like, you're never going to pay people in advance now? Or, like, what do you want to make sure game does take away from that experience? Because for one, definitely be careful of who we're hiring, uh, you know, how we pay them as well, when we pay them. And yeah, that four month of no communication, I will go crazy because we, you know, like you say, you needed that ship to progress the game. Like, what do you want to make sure we take away from that experience? Well, that, that experience was, you know, I did, I did, what you're supposed to. I checked out his references and everything, and he and he. That's the weird thing. Um, he checked out, and the reference was also high end. I I ended up researching his references again. Like I was basically two emails from talking to people's mom. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, so yeah, it's it's basically research your artists and um, do the payments in milestones with proof. Uh, either use. Um, PayPal, which is PayPal is, is, is a safe bet regarding this. It can be a bit expensive when you're dealing with high numbers uh, using PayPal, but um, make sure that the payment uh, is, is either you do it by milestones, you get proof that it gets done, uh, do a contract, for God's sake, do a contract, <laughs> um, check the references, uh, and just do some digging, because I did end up doing a lot of digging, and I found a lot of stuff, so it was... Uh, Something I learned as well. So it was a learning experience, but it was 8% of my budget that I would not pay for to get that learning experience, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so, um, so, yeah, always research and be careful. It can really, there is a lot of 
uh, frauds out there. There is. Yeah, you got to do that research, especially, you know, it's a big part of the budget. That's true. It, well, it, it, 8%, it's a lot. When you're in Indy, 8% is a lot. And But you also take into account the time that was lost which is even worse than the 8%. Because if we only if we only had the ship, we could have fixed it. And the worst thing is, like, if, if for any reason he c- couldn't do it, if he just told me, I could have adapted. The yeah. thing is, there was nothing. And it was like, that was totally new for me. Like, how do I do this? And even the consultant was like, I've never heard about this before. Like, this is insane. And he was like, uh, do you think that maybe his... Uh, uh, his email was hacked or somebody like somebody stole his identity or something. And I was like, uh, no, <laughs> you don't, that's not, that's impossible. So, um, well, it's not impossible, but it didn't happen in this case. So yeah. And, uh, it was, it was really good when I got that email in, in December and he's like, everything you said is correct. And I'm like, yes, I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> so, cause we also had, um, case where he used the art of other, artist in his application to me um Jeez. and uh, i ended up doing the research in december because i was like okay i'm gonna dig deeper and uh, yeah i found there were four four cases of plagiarism so yeah it's uh, yeah Oof, heavy oh heavy and i want to ask like so that's four months of no communication like how did you and your team pass through those moments like because th- those were tough times like what do y'all do to keep pushing forward you know to not necessarily overcome that harsh moment but like what do i do to keep pressing forward well what we did was that we um went to the asset store and we bought a ship there um to use for to just basically use to check the buoyancy system and the ocean and uh just at least do something and we found a ship that was the same size and everything. So it didn't stop up completely on a lot of stands, but also at the same time it did. Uh, so we just basically focused on other things that we we're going to need. Like, what do I know that I need in the ship? Okay, I need this, this, and this. Uh, we also had the animations uh, for the, the whale that uh, needed to be implemented. We had the boat so we could do the mini game. Uh, we could start on that, doing the basics for all the art. So you can always find something to do. But it was it was it was really bad uh, because what am I going to do with all the props if I don't have the ship to put the props in? So yeah, it was you you can always find something to do, but uh, we didn't have it. The normal thing to do for me would have been just to get in a, in a second artist when I hit September. Like okay, I'm seeing this is not going to work, but we didn't have the budget for it either. So we had to be creative basically which is which game dev is all about of course so it was yeah it was nothing new it's like what uh, mike said uh, was that game dev is all about adaption so this is your adaption and it's a big one but you know we can handle it and we did so yeah the point is like you should not give up just cuz you know one bad moment happened of course it sucks that it happened but yeah you just got to keep pressing forward and try to be productive as possible or yeah find something creative like you bought from the accessor so that that kind of helped in a way yeah it did it did and and it's it, it was you know it was enough if i didn't have a consultant i think that i would probably have dropped the project cuz i wouldn't know what to do with that so it's really good if you're an indie and you're new to all of it and spending 50 or 100 bucks paying this guy for his hours. Like, what do you think about this? And just asking for advice because it's really good advice and it's going to save a lot of time in the future. So if I didn't have him, it would probably have been canceled because I would have been at a complete loss. So. Yeah, and I do agree, like, having mentors or consultants, it, it just saves you a ton of time, and, like, they, they point you to the right direction. Like, it, it's they so, it, it really, really helps. And I'm curious, like, so you've been, you, you've been working on this game now, you know, you're project late for 10 people, you've been doing the game development for a few months, or, like, for a while now, so what do you think yeah. was, like, the biggest time, biggest waste of time during game development that you, you want to take back on? The biggest waste of time? Yeah. Um, wow, that's a tough one. The biggest waste of time is when you when you jump into something without doing the research of what you're going to do. I think that's the uh, biggest waste of time. Like we did, we did the ocean system, and I did not research how the ocean system should work. 
And I was just telling him like how I want it. And he's like, yeah, but this that's not how it works and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> and because uh, I'm stubborn. And uh, he, he ends up saying, OK, let's do it like that just to teach me a lesson. So <laughs> the biggest waste of time is, is, is not doing research. Like do the research, save the time. If you don't do any research, you're going to waste a lot of time and a lot of time of everybody. So, yeah, that is... Uh, biggest waste of time i guess <laughs> yeah do the research it's yeah it's i think that's like one of the main points you just got to do a lot of research to avoid a lot of setbacks um what have you changed your mind about in the last few years and why in terms of the game industry oh well i haven't been in the game industry for a few years but uh yet not yet i don't know what i've changed my mind about because i haven't really gotten to that point yet but um i think it's maybe the scope of what I'm doing may have, may have changed my mind a bit because of what I've learned from being in the industry for a year now. And it basically, you know, I, I started with a huge idea of the scope and I'm like, I had to change my mind to kind of take it down a little bit, but I, without moving all the core features. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm too young for that, Tony. I'm, too <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm like a baby in the industry yet. You know? so. Oh yeah. And, in the future, you're gonna be you're gonna be one of those top guys, right? <laughs> uh, well, uh, we hope so. But it's not <laughs> like the thing is like um, I also work for an indie company uh, here in Stirling, the UK, because my wife is studying here. And uh, they were actually talking about the game when I was at the interview there. And he's like, "Well, no, I don't. How, do you think that this indie game you're working on is a job?" You know, they were asking me, and I'm like, "No, I don't have a job. I have a passion." Oh. So that's basically, I read that somewhere on the internet. <laughs> but it's, it's, uh, it's basically, you know, just how it is. And it's not about the money for me in this game. It's just, if you want to break into the industry and you don't know how, be a doer and just do something. And if you, if like the, my teacher said, even if you fail, you're going to learn so much. You're going to have such a good network already. You're going to already know a lot of stuff that you don't know from before that you can only learn by doing it. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so for all those people that say, you know, they, they get passionate in the beginning, but then the passion just like slowly goes away. What do you do or what do you suggest other people do to, you know, keep that passion flowing, like keep that passion going? Yeah. How to keep the fire. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was also some of the stuff that I researched a lot, was that uh, you start off very passionate, you have all these great ideas, you're writing everything down, everything is going so fast, you want to put out dev updates every week, every day if you could, you know, everything is so great. And then like, huh, you start like, oh God, what have I gotten myself <laughs> into? So I, I see this happening a lot. I see this happening a lot. You see that a lot of in, at NDDB uh, game ideas starting out great and they gradually just keep dying. And somewhere in between there, something happened that they lost their motivation, right? So that's something that I always try to think about every single time, that this cannot be a project that dies, period. Uh, also, having a contract, you know, helps. <laughs> but uh, how do I stay motivated? Just being active, basically. Just looking at what other people create, playing small games that a 14-year-old from India was doing, just being inspired. Uh, I have the. I'm very lucky to be working with a lot of indie devs, and they all always do game jams. So it's kind of easy for me to be motivated because even if I'm having a very bad day, you can, we we always have this chat, and they're like, "Oh, I'm doing this and this," and then you you know you start you know moving your shoulders a little bit, and I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, that's great," and you start talking, and suddenly the motivation goes up again. Um, and also playing the games you like, uh, doing another. Do a walk, basically. I do that every day, almost. I do a 20-minute walk around here where I just think about my game and what I want to do, what I want to change. That also helps me keep me motivated because it keeps my brain working on the game instead of just being, oh, this is a bother. Then it just makes me, oh, this will be cool to change. Always trying not to add to the scope, of course, <laughs> because Mike would kill me. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, it, it's if you want to stay motivated... Just be active in the forums. Go read in the forums of GameDev.net, uh, TigSource, IndieDB. Um, look at all the little things that people with no experience are doing. 
and just think by yourself that I can do the same thing. Because if you really want to do it, you can do it. That's the thing. Uh, where the community is great, so yeah. Yeah, you, you got to be proactive, man. That, that's all there is to it. You just got to be Absolutely. proactive. And so you said you've been in the industry for a year now. What do you think was the best investment you've ever made? It can be investment of money, time, or energy. And you mentioned, of course, a consultant was one of them. What, what yeah. other investments that you think was like a great? Great investments. Uh, well, yeah, the consultant is one, probably the best. But other than that, greatest investment that I did – for what I'm doing has to be some of the courses at Udemy, actually, when I think about it, um, because they can give you a lot of there's a there's a lot of game dev uh, courses there as well. Some are better than others, of course, but you also have some about project management uh, and they're really good to invest a little bit of money in uh, and just taking the time to to watch it and say, how do you lead a team? How do you how do you not become a buddy with somebody that works for you for you? in case you know you need to let him go and mm-hmm. how do you distinguish your, your, the difference because you can't get too close and you still have to you know you're man you're, you're managing stuff you're not being a friend and a buddy hopefully you're also a friend but at the same time you have to keep uh, keep a distance so um using some money and and looking up some courses on udemy was really good for me but it, the best investment has to be mike that's uh any given he what he did in the beginning was like hey i have this great idea you know and he's like okay so what is it <laughs> and i was like here's a high concept document and he's like okay this looks interesting so how does this work what happens when the player presses this button and i'm like um yeah that's a good <laughs> question uh so he's like okay here's what you need to do write a mock-up what happened like i press this button a window pops up and like from real child level uh and do a scene that you think is important for a game and write it completely just written and we'll take another look. And yeah, that answered a lot of questions that I did not think about, of course. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and that, that's also um, uh, an advice that I've been giving on Reddit when people ask there. It's like, do the mock-up this way. You're going to see how deep your game really is and how much you have not thought about. So trying to save the time of other young aspiring devs like myself as well. Appreciate that. Yeah. And thanks for that, Tommy, for <laughs> you taking the time to, you know, uh, communicate with the community. And so that, that's really awesome. So we definitely appreciate that. Yeah. I think uh, a lot of the um, people that follow the game on NDDB and, and the forum and Discord, they can tell you I'm always answering. Like, I don't think it never goes a day in between an answer from a question being put and an answer coming from me because I'm usually online in some way all the time. Um, so I, I think it's important to keep the transparency and be there because the game industry is changing where they want more direct contact with the devs. They don't want to go to a forum and wait two weeks for an answer to come. And so, yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. Like if I, if I get a question, it doesn't matter what it is. Uh, I'll try to answer it like it, as fast as and deep as I can. Even if it has nothing to do with my game. So, yeah. Oh, man. You, Tommy, you, you are definitely starting right off, right? You're, you're communicating with the team. You're communicating with your game. You're helping out the community. You're, you're, you're doing things really good. <laughs> Thank you. I, I <laughs> just, I just gotta tell you, yeah, you're doing things good. Yeah, of course, you know, you got, you're still learning and stuff like that, but from what it sounds like, you're doing a great job. So I, I just, from the th- what you're telling me and everything, yeah, it, it, it sounds like you're doing great. And uh, yeah, so let's go ahead and move on. Um, what do you think was the greatest idea you had to date, like an aha moment? That has to be the character customization that I was going to do in the game. That was the new idea I had maybe in, was it December? I think it was December. Because uh, I, I love fine art. I, I, I absolutely love that, you know, these old portraits and pictures from the 16th, 17th century, old kings and stuff. I think they're amazing. So I was like, what if you take that and just put it in my game? Instead of doing a deep character customization, you just have this portrait and you have the captain's table and harpoon and stuff like that. And you can change hats and costume and face. And it will basically be a fine art portrait that will be end up on your captain's table in the game. And I was like, oh, that was like, oh, yes, we have to do it. And that's what we're working on right now. <laughs> so that's how fast that changed. So, uh, so yeah, that, that has to be, I think, my, my greatest idea that I'm most proud of. 
like in lately unless you know if you think about the whaler as, as a whole but uh yeah mike wasn't like uh that's too much <laughs> yeah no he was like okay that's not bad because i got dominic to make make all the assets and the video so he could just see oh that's how you want it okay that's not bad because it's 2d so uh from a programming standpoint it's it's much better than having the whole 3d thing and yeah you know, yeah i think you know sometimes the simpler is the better and you can make it look pretty and nice as well without diving into too much technical stuff mm -hmm. and people love customization too they do they do there's no doubt about it i do it myself like i love playing games where i can customize a lot of stuff so. Definitely. So the game industry is booming. Like, well, what are you most excited about today? You know, the, the Switch is doing really well. There's AR, there's VR. Like, is there anything in general that you're really excited about? AR. I'm really excited about AR. I don't think VR is, it's not really VR yet, I think, in my opinion. Um, it's just the Samsung in front of your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but the, uh, but there's a lot of cool stuff coming from VR as well. It's it's a, it's a new technology thing, even though it's been around many years. But uh, you know they had to start somewhere. But the AR is really cool. Like I I'm waiting for the game that you can see in Star Wars. Is it the first one? No, Episode Five, uh, where Chewbacca is playing that you know thing on the table and the monsters are kicking each other and stuff like that. <laughs> I want to see that through my phone on my kitchen table. That's what I want to play. And through my phone, so that's what I'm. I'm really. I'm just waiting for that game. So I'm really excited about AR. Also, oh, you're saying like they already announced that type of game, or you just you're wishing for that type of game? <laughs> I'm wishing for it. I'm waiting. <laughs> okay. Like somebody has to make it. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. AR. yeah. So probably somebody is too, but I just haven't seen it. But uh, AR it has to be the thing that is really exciting. What is that one game that influenced you the most, and why? Man of War. Man of War, actually. Uh, it was um, a naval game I played back in the 90s. Uh, I didn't actually remember the name for it. The guy at the forum, we were talking about what other naval games do we like. And I was like, there's always this one game that I remember. And that is like, I could, I could be on a Man of War and I could shoot other, uh, I think it was English ships or something like that. It was real pixelated, really bad. But uh, he... Um, He's like, oh yeah, it's called Man of War Harris, a trailer, like gameplay video. And I'm like, yeah, that's the one. And that's the game that has always, always uh, been stuck and influenced. And I think that maybe has to do something with the whaler today. Well, well so Man of War, what, what kind of gameplay is that? That is basically, you're on the ship, first person. Uh, basically, it's just a screen and you could just turn around. You could use a spyglass and look at other and just fire. Oh, okay. But it was really bad quality. You know, it, it was this was early '90s, so for the time it was great because I remember my computer at the time had to, it even struggled doing it, like <laughs> playing it, but it was like lagging more than it was uh, doing. So uh, yeah, and then also um, Sid Meier's Pirates is also really good. Uh, sea Dogs uh, is probably called Pirates of the Caribbean, but uh, yeah, those are the Man of War has to be the one. I know there's a few games coming out uh, that involves you know pirates and ships. I think it's called Sea of Thieves or Sea of Thieves. Yeah. Are you are you excited for those games? Yes, I actually tried the alpha, and I'm trying the beta now in four days as well. Uh, sea of Thieves is great. Like I love the style. It's it's absolutely amazing. Um, Black Wake. I'm also really good fan of Black Wake. So yeah, there, there seems to be booming naval games um, coming. <laughs> Yeah, a lot to look forward to. So, yeah. Very uh, much. Awesome. Uh, the show isn't over yet in Game Dust. Before we're going to the lightning round, I just want to mention, make sure you subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or other platforms to listen to more inspiring stories and gain a valuable knowledge. And now, Tommy, I will ask you quick questions, and you'll be giving us a ton of valuable information in return. Are you ready to crush the lightning round? Yes. Yes. So what was holding you back from joining the game industry? There has to be knowledge. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how the industry works. Uh, so knowledge was definitely holding me back, I think. Is the, in, in Norway, is it big over there, the game industry? Not really. Uh, it, it's getting bigger, uh, definitely. Um, we have Hyper Games, uh, Krill Bytes. You also have D-Pad, who made Owlboy. Oh, uh, yeah. Famicom, of course. Um, and a lot of other uh, small timers that are really making it and getting there. So, uh, yeah, it, it's getting bigger, but it is a small industry. Yeah, I actually interviewed uh, Adrian from Owlboy. 
game. Oh, yeah. I and mean, I heard that game is amazing. I still need to try it out. But yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, it's pretty good. Very good, actually. It's a, it's a, it's a very, it's a beautiful game, pixelated. Uh, and it's like, it's just well done. So yeah. Yeah, and it's just awesome to hear the game industry growing globally. Like, it, oh, that's yeah. just an awesome thing to hear. It is, it is. What's a personal habit that contributes to your success? Mm, <laughs> well, it, maybe it's, it's, I don't know. I'm, I'm very stubborn. Uh, I think that, contra- and, and I'm very persistent. Like, I, I, and also I think being creative, I don't know if it's a habit, but I don't know. It's, it's kind of hard to tell. Really, because I don't know what contributed to my success, if it's just the game or the way I do it. But, um, yeah, just being on and stubborn, I think. Being active, to me, it sounds like what it is, because you told us a story about the guy that didn't want to communicate with you, but every single day you were trying to communicate with this guy. And so yeah. you you were persistent in trying to get you know get things done or get some going. Yeah, it's like, uh, it's it's... You know, be be a doer. Just you know, just don't settle for for situations like that. Just because it it's you know it's very easy to okay you know I'm never gonna get this money back and just just let it leave it. But that's what they want. They want you to get tired of talking and not getting anything back. So being persistent and and stubborn maybe yeah <laughs> it uh, kind of help yeah. It kind of coincides being being stubborn and <laughs> being persistent. Yeah, it does. yeah. <laughs> What's the best piece of advice you've ever received? The best piece of advice I've ever received. Well, it was basically to start small. Um, uh, I assume this is according to Game Dev. So um, to start small, to think small uh, regarding the game, uh, obviously, because if if I didn't have the one guy that said you can't have all this, you have to kind of tone it down. Uh, you know, as I as I mentioned earlier, everything would have just fallen apart. So yeah. The, Best piece of advice was start small. Actually, like, do you think your game is actually still small compared to like uh, other indie games? Because your to me, your game still sound like it's kind of I, I guess big for your first game. You know, what I it's mean? big. Yeah, it is. It's big for my first game. Um, we have a lot of stuff we will implement in the game, but it's not crucial right now uh, because do you have a budget? Do you have time? And uh, so, yeah, we, we have big plans for it, but we have to start small doing it. So uh, we have to lay the foundation before we put everything else in. Definitely. Uh, what's a great marketing tip to make yourself and your game stand out? Start uh, start marketing your game early. Don't wait until you've finished it. Because I see this a lot of uh, on, on Facebook uh, groups for game devs. And they're like, hey, I finished my game, but I'm not getting downloads or views or whatever. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Well, you're starting. You're starting marketing it now. You should have started. <laughs> that's too late already. Like, unless it's something really extraordinary, you should just start in the beginning because you're going to get so many good tips by marketing it. If, if it's on Twitter or IndieDB or the forums, um, and if you want to make it stand out, think outside of the box. Be niche. Do research of the game idea you have and see w- what separates your game from the other game. That is already out there. That's how you have to think, because uh, you don't want to end up making a clone just with a different art style. Because I, th- I, I think that's useless. I think that is, it kind of it limits your creativity. Because I know you can do better. So yeah, just be niche. <laughs> how, how did you first begin your your marketing? So like, tell us like your first way of marketing your game. Like, what did you do? I went on EDDB. The first place I went was just there. Uh, I didn't go to Twitter until, uh, I don't know, maybe August or something like that. And I started uh, in NDDB in January, no, February, March, I think. So, yeah, that's uh, that's that's where I went, just on NDDB. Uh, also, because I didn't know where else to go. I didn't wasn't sure about Twitter and stuff like that. So using use use the, the pages that are out there. To help marketing, you have Game Jolt as well. Um, I don't know how well that is for unfinished projects. I think it's more for games that are already done. But um, yeah, IndieDB was the where I, was where I went. So and it helped, and I did the thing. I got a publisher through it. So oh yeah, yeah. So it it works, definitely works. Get but started. You, you get started, but you also have to to think about one thing that it's 
it's an exception. You know, this is, it's not a, it's what they say about success as well. You know, getting that first game as a hit, that is not the rule. That is the exception. I think Rama Ismail said that, I mean, or something like that. And, you know, you can't, oh, yes, I'm going to get famous by making this game. Already there, like, if you're in it for the money, ha, huh, you're in the wrong freaking, <laughs> you're in the wrong business, my man. So, yeah. Yeah, as long as you just start marketing as early as possible on on the, the, these different platforms, you just yeah. you never you never know until you put it out there. That's the thing. So definitely, That's the thing. you never you never know. Yeah, definitely just get started. Do the research on the on the the various pages and forums you can use, and just put it out there. Uh, just start early on. Use Facebook. Use Twitter. Use IndieDB. Um, push hard, but don't spam, and make sure that you have something to show, basically. And also, all, of course, have the answers for the questions that you're expecting to get. Because you don't want to do that, um, oh yeah, sorry, that's a good question. Because <laughs> <You know, like, laughs> they, they assume that you already know all of this. So, and players, they don't think the same way as the devs do. Like, they want to, they want when they ask you something, they need to get the answer. So, if you're a player, like, if you, if you want to, if you're asking a game dev, th- just think about what questions you would have asked. And yeah, just prepare and go market. Have transparency, be in contact, answer back as fast as you can. And uh, yeah, that's what I did. Yeah, you're absolutely right about having answers ready for those questions. Like people, yeah, they there, there's always going to be questions. And so the sooner you can think about those answers, the better. So you can just answer them right away. And, you know, you won't keep the audience waiting or, or yeah. wondering what's going on and stuff. Exactly, but we don't always have the answers either. But you should be able to fake it at least, you know, like <laughs> while while you like Google it, like shit. so. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, you should know it already, basically. But we don't. But still, it's something you need to expect. Yeah, give give them something. <laughs> uh, give them something. <laughs> so this next question is a bit of a doozy. So take your time if you need to. Imagine you woke up in the next morning in a brand new world and you knew no one. You still have all the experience and knowledge you currently have today. Your food and shelter is taken care of and you have a laptop. What would you do with step by step on the path to join and become successful in the game industry? Uh, wow. <laughs> That's uh, okay. What would I do if I only had a laptop and a new world and all the info I know now? Mm hmm. Yeah. Uh,. What would I do? I would check if Facebook was still a thing. I don't know. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I'm, I don't know what I would do. That's a very good question. Um, to be a part, I, w- I would just, I would take the computer. Uh, I would do what I already did. I would write down 10 ideas, um, elevator pitch ideas, and I would take another look and see which one stood out and make another game, I think. That's what I think I would do. Or I would sit down while I was, you know, thinking hard and long about it and try to learn coding so I could do everything myself. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's probably what I would do. The same thing that I did, basically. <laughs> yeah, and I- I'm glad you mentioned that last part because uh, it- it's hard to do everything by yourself. Like, it. it- I, I don't know how, uh, I think the Stardew Valley, I forgot the developer name for that one, but he was able to create it himself, but that took five years or more than five years, I think. So making the game yourself yeah. is extremely hard. And so a bigger chance, you have a bigger chance of burning yourself out too, because you, you end up sitting at home working all the time mm-hmm. and you need to think about yourself too. You know, you need to, to be able to say like, I need to let go for today. Basically I need to, do something else because I don't know. There was a Twitter post here the other day that we need to acknowledge that the lifestyle we're doing is unhealthy. It is because we work too much. That's the thing. We, that we're always working, uh, especially when you're alone. If you're doing everything about yourself, if you're doing the coding, you're doing the art, you're doing level design, you're doing the marketing, you're doing everything like that is way too much for one person. But even though I respect the people that do it because it's tough, mm-hmm. it is really tough. Uh, people, normal people can never understand how tough it is. Um, and also the thing that's going on in the media where uh, game devs are receiving the threats. Uh, I think Ram Ismail was, was tweeting this uh, uh, the other day. And it, it is really tough because <laughs> there's a lot of toxic environments out there, you know. 
uh, and you also have the, the you have the physical part and you have the mental part. Like I've seen, um, there was a game. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm mentioning the right one. I think it was Hard for Alicia, which is a great game that I backed. Uh, even the dev there, I think I was reading that he had to step back because of health issues. Uh, I don't know if 100% it has to do with game dev, but I think he mentioned that it was a part of it. And either way, just sitting and doing that all the time and not taking care of yourself is equally as important as everything else that you're doing. So, uh, so yeah. Yeah, your health should be number one priority. Like it's you. And plus, when you're in a healthy state, you have that creative uh, juices flowing as well. So it's just good to be healthy in general. Yeah, you're you're more productive because you're in a happier state. You feel you get more done. You know, uh, like that's even if you only have to step away twenty minutes just for that walk to clear your mind a little bit. You know, and and it is so important. And it is it is a it's a sad part of the industry though that because there it, there's a lot of a lot of uh, devs that you know they struggle a little bit because they are always alone you end up sitting there and just you know sitting in the dark and because you really really want to get this game out um you're betting everything that you have every time you have every time all the friends the social life everything because you need to get it out because you want to earn money you have to pay rent or whatever and and that that does something to you it's 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 really bad so um it's equally as important to 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 take, take a step back yeah and me and Tommy, we are encouraging you, game devs, to take a break. Do not underestimate the break because it is definitely helpful if you take it. So definitely, uh, you know, if you're feeling mentally down or anything, just, just take that step back, refresh yourself, and yeah, and then get back to it once you feel refreshed. Mm-hmm. Correct. We have reached the end. Go ahead and give us one last parting piece of guidance and then how we can connect with you, and we'll say goodbye. Yeah, you can uh, you can check out uh, thewhalergame.com. Uh, you can connect with me there or at Twitter at Swim Studios. Uh, also at NDB, The Whaler. You can just uh, connect as well because I have all my info there. Uh, we also have Discord open if you want to join in and talk with us, uh, talk to the artists, the devs, uh, uh, programmers, whatever. Um, and yeah, that's how you can do it. <laughs> awesome. Tommy, it's been a pleasure. He shared a lot of great stuff with us, especially since you're still relatively new to the industry. So that's definitely helpful for us new game though. So we are truly grateful and we will catch you next time. Thank you very much, Tony. Thank you again, Dubs, for listening. I hope you are feeling inspired. Go check out GameDubLoadout.com and type in the number 85 in the search bar to find Tommy's episode. Equip yourself with the best loadout and take action because knowledge is only potential power. Execution is the game. I'm Tony Chan, and i catch you next Wednesday on the GameDubLoadout podcast. Peace.